thank you very much for joining us, Shane. And I'll let you talk about blockchain beer and sustainable yeah. whiskey. I'm sure people will be happy to hear more <laughs> yeah, about that. For sure. So thanks very much, guys. Um, yeah, very grateful to take the opportunity to talk to you guys. I'm sure you can tell by the accent. I'm an Irish native, so I'll try and speak as slowly as possible so everyone can understand. But as I'm sure you can see from some of the introductions, Ireland Craft Beverages and Downstream, uh, Kuroa and Whiskey, uh, big passion for craft beverages um, from the island of Ireland. So today I'm just going to talk you guys through, I suppose, the whole innovation and where the idea and the how and the why came about with downstream beer. Starting off with our initial company which was Ireland Craft Beverages, an export, a global export company which led then to the innovations of downstream and also then a whiskey business which is only around a year old now but uh, that's another collaboration <coughs> with a, a team of very passionate guys in the space. So yeah to, to kind of connect the dots in the beginning here Ireland Craft Beverages was set up in 2014, primarily as an export business, um, <coughs> set up by, by three good friends, actually an old college friend of mine uh, from back home in the Moor Mountains in Northern Ireland, and an old friend from, from Sligo as well, um, the three of us came together, put our minds together to actually build an export platform primarily for export of artisan independent beverages. So supporting the wave of new craft beverages coming into the space and supporting the wave of new Irish distilleries and cideries. Independent brands, which are all very much family owned, very passionate people are behind it. And the quality in some of the products speak for themselves in terms of the differential that they bring to the mass market, which had somewhat dominance, I would say, in the market through the 80s and 90s in, in the beer space, uh, especially. Uh, as I'm sure you guys have seen, not just in Ireland, the UK, across Europe and the USA, this was a global phenomenon. So moving on then, I'm just going to, I suppose, moving on from the export business and, and where downstream came about after setting the export business up with the team, moving ahead with, with new supply chains into 20 plus global markets. We noticed that a lot of our suppliers were, were being pushed and uh, were struggling a lot with, with fake brands and beverages in the domestic market. Uh, so this kind of raised a red flag to us and, and what was actually happening and how the in industry was being structured. So just to move on, I suppose, um, with, with the downstream Taste of Ireland worldwide and how that collaborated with downstream the whole phenomenon of this beer was was almost out of problem solving like anything everything from the diamond industry to the finance industry my knowledge in the space of blockchain comes from a corporate background in commodities and uh, financial technology so seeing such headlines uh, the downstream and and uh, the whole ethos of of showing a taste of ireland worldwide and where downstream came about so these were some of the problems that we were trying to solve in in the domestic industry for a lot of these new suppliers there are headlines such as fake craft beer popping up all around ireland there is no way of people proving the authenticity of their product and um, you know there is no real you look at labels and how archaic they, they are and there hasn't been massive innovation innovation in this space in a long time so for us we, we kind of seen all this pressure happening in our suppliers and seen them being squeezed and we wanted to put our heads together and look how we might be able to to put a touch of digi digitization onto products um, and having that knowledge of what blockchain was doing in the whole immutable and audit trail space uh, allowed us then to to look into the market and what technologies were available if i move on then to to i suppose what some large associations were doing in the united states and in ireland uh, they were adding symbols to their to the back of their labels uh, you can see some of them here the Bruin Association Independent Craft, Ireland Irish Craft Beer Independent, which, as you can imagine, these are very easily uh, frauded and copycatted. Um, so that brought us into looking at a partnership with, with who was kind of doing traceability in, in the product space, who was digitizing stuff in the space. And it was still early days. It was 2017 and the, the technology was still evolving very much so. We, a local Belfast company called Arknet, were, were actually making huge strides in meat traceability. They were based in Edinburgh and Belfast. So that brought us to, to actually meet up with them and, and start some brainstorming um, 
around how we can digitize and actually bring an audit trail to the full process of brewing everything from you know where the malt and the water usage and um, to then because we were building new supply chains we could create that supply chain the whole way almost to the consumer so then i suppose that led us to putting our heads together with arcnet to create this innovation and shape a kind of new digital norm in the beer space uh, that's where the whole mixing of the technology and beer came about our main i suppose our main purpose on the product was was to try and make it as easy as possible for the consumer but also uh, we didn't want to overcomplicate uh, by putting too much data out there as well and so for us uh, number one being putting of course a, a high quality craft beer to market was was the first priority and that alongside then making it easy for consumers to to dial in and improve the provenance and the authenticity of what they were drinking so simply allowing them to to you know the vast choice in craft beer these days is in the thousands so easing that by the use of technology was something that we wanted to try and put a solution to so then i suppose moving on to to the beer itself and that process uh, that's where we come up with the idea of downstream beer itself and there, there is the friction there on the qr codes you know the qr codes has been around a long time the same way that barcodes have for us i suppose almost luckily you look, the Western world almost forgot about the QR code, whereas you look at countries like China and Asia, they use it on a daily basis as verification and payments. And it was almost a reversal of, of big companies like Apple in 2018, 2017, we integrated cameras to automatically pick up QR codes. So for us, that led to actually putting it as front and center of the brand itself. And as you can imagine, the name downstream is all about the downstream of data giving that data to the consumer, empowering the data by giving them as much interactive or, or what we, I suppose, being advocates in the craft beer space, what we thought they would like to know. Um, so we, we went about uh, creating that engagement process with the secure audit trail um, and interlinking with one another. So as you can see here, this was the first product that we brought to market. It was, uh, it was a hoppy lager and um, it was done by the downstream, um, by the Iron Craft Beverages team in a local brewery in Northern Ireland where, where we reside from. It was done by Moore Mountains Brewery. And what we did is we took the whole process of the brew, everything from the mineral makeup of, of you know, your beer makes up 90% water. So we wanted to give the mineral makeup of the water to the hops, the malts, the yeast, when the can and bot bottling was done, you know, and then when it was shipped out. So that, that whole um, audit trail was then put on to uh, ArcNet's um, private blockchain ledger, which was then integrated with a UX, which, which linked with the QR code. So moving on to, this is, this is a little, I suppose, inside of the first UX that we used. Um, you know, we did put pictures in it because we didn't want to jump straight in with them. Um, with just hard data, giving it to consumers. So we engaged people with pictures and video alongside, you can see on the right hand side there, you know, the, every single bottle was uniquely identified. Uh, there was uh, 4,104 bottles in the total batch of this run. You know, this, this bottle that we took a screen grab from was number 3,398. 3, uh, you can see as well, you know, who the head brewer was when it was done, thir 13th of November. 2017 and then you can see the 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 hash there on on everything that was underlined was hashed so this is the data that we thought or the factual data that we uh, were thinking that consumers would really uh, um, be interested in and that's what we wanted to 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 give to them uh, in a beer with them um, with their purchase of of a can or a bottle of downstream that that was this is basically the optimization of the ux code um, so we built the whole step-by-step -step process of the packaging to the kettle and the mash, the conditioning, the hops. So this was the real engaging part because like everything, people buy with their eyes. So when they engage in your story, the visuals are very important as well as the hard data that you're giving to them. So we created this six-step process here from the packaging to the conditioning, fermentation, kettle run, mashing and raw materials, and really allowing people to enjoy the journey of their beer but also alongside having the, 
uh, I suppose the notoriety that uh, everything was verified and, and um, you know, it wasn't any type of uh, fake brand uh, that, that had come to market. This is the optimization that we created then with the, with the UX code to allow it on mobile, iPads uh, and laptops. Bear with me. And then the, the final step was really the, the QR interaction. Uh, what we did was create an actual video of the brew day as well. I suppose just a rubber stamp uh, that, you know, we were there in the brew day. This is what took place. This is a, a beautiful picture of Silent Valley where the waters would have been taken from for the actual downstream beer itself. We wanted to give all of this to consumers and, and kind of finish off with a, with a nice video interaction for them to, to finish off their, their experience with the beer. So, you know, what other advantages does it bring to the, to the party in terms of uh, the, adding this level of uh, security and, and audit trail for us? You know, we wanted, I suppose, to guarantee the support for our suppliers, which in turn would guarantee the support of local Irish businesses and employment. And, you know, some, some of the biggest brands in Ireland um, compared to the craft beer space if you look at the numbers the craft beer space actually would hire up to 70 percent employment in comparison to, to some of the larger commercial ones and, and you know that creates this local economy and support that in turn i think you know people are becoming more and more interested in so that kind of um, aided our our ethos of wanting to help our, our suppliers in, in this um, solution that we were bringing to market some of the other bits then if you move on to the actual security that it adds, you know, you can see here, you've got a whole, another level of brand security, authentication, communication. So there is a whole background element here where, you know, you can almost um, pivot up to uh, the whole supply chain inventory management, <clears throat> especially when it comes to, to uh, something like the, the agent of whiskey, which takes a number of years and, and something I know that a lot of other uh, distilleries have started to look at because there's a lot of gray areas in not just regulation and labeling but um, also fraud some of the biggest brands in the world have, have massive problems with with parallel trading you know when they're sending hundreds if not thousands of containers around the world that kind of track and traceability um, is, a, is a massive factor for them when they're losing out millions if not you know up to billions for, for some consumers and it's not just whiskey it's everything from makeup brands to consumer bills and fast movement consumer products. So this was a level of security that, that allowed people to kind of bring another player to, to the fraud game uh, and something that, that also can be controlled if, if you're doing this level of uh, traceability within your process. Um, so I suppose moving on then to other integrations on the technology, for us, we really feel this is only the beginning in terms of a lot of people talk about the use of digitization, blockchain and Internet of Things. I really do feel that, that that engagement with the two technologies does bring it to the next level. Not only does it give you that direct engagement with brands here, but what you can also do is you can create you, you can create your own hypothesis on, on carbon footprint. If you want to, you know, tell or do real time, some, some more modernized breweries would have pretty advanced SAP solutions that you can create APIs onto, which means you can actually get real-time data scraped onto your audit trail while you're going through the process. And with that, you can actually take key data. I know it hasn't come into play as of yet, but down the line, there may be um, enforced regulation to actually create a hypothesis showcasing your carbon footprint. So, you know, whether it's your electricity usage to the wastage of your grain and, and where that life cycle of wastage actually goes to, to, you know, the water usage or even, you know, how sustainable is the grain that you use and where exactly does that come from? You know, is it imported? Is, is it, is it local? And how sustainable is that kind of agricultural side of things? So it does, it does get a lot more complex if you keep going down to even the soil elements, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, I suppose that's where some people have, got into especially in the whiskey making process and that's something that you really can show traceability on if you do enter this level of, of um, transparency the other side of it i suppose is you can integrate the, the smart contracts so if you if you have a smart contract on top of your audit trail that can quickly run um, an algorithm over the top so 
maybe in the food industry, for instance, if you had someone with allergies and they were always cautious about what they were buying, but they had <clears throat> digital products or they had a way of integrating something like their smartphone or watch or glasses that could very quickly run a smart contract over your digital audit trail <clears throat> to pinpoint and red flag, <clears throat> excuse me, red flag anything that you were allergic to. I think that has, has some big advantages in this space as well. And again, you know, you can run this from a verification or even a tax standpoint, especially with alcohol when you're moving across borders. HMRC and tax regulation is a massive factor in, in terms of is liquid moving across borders being accounted for correctly? And, um, you know, there's levels of play here where you can integrate tax systems from countries in <clears throat> import and export goods and they can run their own regulation on top of it. <clears throat> so that, that allows them to, I suppose, gives them more uh, secure data around uh, frauds, fraudulent activity. Uh, so that, that's some of the, the stuff that we looked with alongside. Of course, you know, you have your augmented reality and gamification, which is probably more about engaging a market inside of things. But all of this uh, was stuff that uh, we dialed into and, and we did review when we were, I suppose, bringing this level of digitization to beer. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to move on then to the upstream of data as well. So of course, with every engagement of your, of your can, you get some type of, of data analytics or Google analytics, you know, if people accept. Now I know with GDPR in Europe, um, it's not as seamless as it used to be, but you know, you, you can still get uh, an upstream of, of data in terms of your consumer and your dem demographic. And I suppose this is more again for the marketing side of things. So, you know, if you wanted to retarget a demographic that you've seen, you know, I think uh, surprisingly, and you know, with QR codes, I think it's it can be uh, less than five percent engagement. And with our first release, we, we actually had over seventy percent of people engage with the product, which was a very successful um, number for us uh, in terms of people, I suppose, showing interest in in uh, the next level of inside their data or inside their label. You know, labels can only hold so much information and so many people are actually uh, scanning through to learn more, learn more about the brands. Uh, I suppose ask questions of what they're supporting and what they're actually uh, putting their spending part towards. So yeah, the, the upstream side of it, you know, obviously you have um, everything from new users to sessions and it's almost just like interacting with the website. Um, so if you're familiar with the analytics of, um, of um, website integration, you can pull that data and, and use that for some marketing material. It just moves on to the involvement of downstream. So after bringing hybrids into cans, we, we actually moved into an exclusive release with Marks and Spencers for, for a period of time where they wanted to show, I suppose, that traceability factor on their shelves. Uh, so they approached us to, to actually uh, bring the product on shelf um, nationally across all UK stores, so, which was a, a good success on, on the R&D side of things. Sorry. Just, but I suppose the, the other side of it was the involvement of, of the recipes and uh, the styles of beer. So we, we then moved on to working with, with one of our, our partners, Flavorly, uh, which is a fully integrated e-commerce site. And I, I suppose for us that makes it even more accessible because you can then plug in to the e-commerce uh, fulfillment center. We, we then exclusively released the, released the other cans with, with Flavorly, which went very well in terms of, of the, the four styles being a Session IPA, Pilsner and Pale Ale. So, what we were taking, I suppose, was was trending styles that we knew people had a taste for, and we were developing um, high quality recipes while putting that traceability onto the QR code, and then giving all of this data and giving all of this information to the consumer. Um, I suppose then moving on to the next step, there was, I suppose, a bit of a bottleneck here in terms of working with a third party in the blockchain elements and. Um, Working with, with Arcnet outside of this, what they did is they actually held all of the data on uh, Amazon Web Services. So there's a charge, as, as I'm sure you're aware, there's, there's monthly fees with Amazon Web Services, which is continuing fees. So unless you're selling high volume continuous beer and putting a sales force or you know, big marketing spend behind this, 
um, it does get to a bit of a bit of a bottleneck here. So we decided a few months ago just to hit the pause button um, until we worked out what we thought is and should be a, a better commercial model, not just for us, but, but for the industry. And just recently, we started talking with guys at uh, Source Labels who, who have come up with new patented technology called GPASS. And this is, this is more uh, a two-in-one solution where you're not having to, to pay these, these uh, hosting charges. You basically pay a per label print fee, which is what you would do in the industry at the minute. Behind that, they have a skin very similar to, to what I just showed you there, basically verifying all the blockchain data on their own platform, but it doesn't have these ongoing costs. And that is where the revival of downstream has moved into. And that's what we're working on at the minute is, is actually the, the rebrew of, of these SKUs. And I suppose even now, more importantly, supply chains have been torn apart and, and can be rebuilt digitally. So it's more and more important I feel, for us to, to bring this to consumers and um, re-engage them or you know showcase the transparency element that that we were bringing to the market initially just to quickly i suppose give you some of the breakdown of gpass and um, this is this is scraped from their own website so you can't find this uh, if you if you look online but you can see very similar the qr system integration for anti-counterfeit anti brand protection and track and trace and these elements are, are are very powerful when it comes to global supply chain, you know, prohibiting counterfeits, as it says there, you know, recording the individual scan information. And this has already been rolled out, you know, not just from ourselves, looking at it from, from other big corporations. Um, I believe even, you know, the, the larger guys like Airbnb Bev and Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola are more using this integration to track and trace the plastic bottles. For recyclability so that's more around the environmental aspect that their products have in the globe and if they're able to actually follow that and uh, take data back in that it's kind of a two-way process and just to, to move on with to some of the, the clients that we worked with and have worked with from from launching the beer as i mentioned before it was launched across mns source market which is in all your well used to be in all of your kinks Kings Cross stations and, and train stations um, here in London. We, we even shipped some to, to Singapore, Honest Brew, Diverse Foods, Flavorly. So these are the guys that we're working with at the moment to look at bringing the e-commerce side back and, and reintegrating this level of transparency for the markets, uh, especially the craft beer consumer. Next slide. Uh, this is just a quick dial into other brands that have already used it in markets. So as you can see here from some headlines, Elsa Bay, uh, tracing the whiskey traceability, you might recognize that brand, uh, Blackwater. It's uh, surprisingly though, just um, on Blackwater, they ended up pulling back on the technology uh, of ArcNets due to the cost price points. And I think the complexities as well, it was almost too heavy for what they were looking for. and. So, you know, some of this technology has to be very easily integrated to the current process of suppliers as well as the consumer. So some of this heavy tech, I think, deters uh, mass integration, integration, and in, especially in the artisan space where people are just passionate about making good liquid and making really high quality beverages. So yeah, just coming towards the end, there is, I did have a video, but I can't share it at the moment uh, just due to the size of it, but the the I've shared it in the chat for everybody. Oh, brilliant. Thanks, Erica. So anyone um, can go into the chat and get the link for that. Yeah, and that, I suppose, it really just concludes the, the story of Downstream and what we're working on in, in the integration of, of uh, the transparency elements in, in craft beer and beverage. So, yeah, that's Downstream in a nutshell. Who was behind ArcNet and how did they mirror your vision? Hmm. Well, ArcNet, I believe, was set up by... Richard Steves, who is um, quite a successful entrepreneur. And I believe the, the initial idea was they wanted to track and trace airplane parts. So he worked with a team in Belfast. I think he was based out of Vancouver. You can, you can read about them in arc-net.io if you want to read more about their company. But there, it was run by a CEO based out of Belfast called Kieran Kelly. But their vision was this whole track and trace element. They were working on food traceability. 
So interestingly, a professor at Queen's University, again, Belfast, was uh, a, a guy called Chris Elliott, uh, who's an OBE. You, you, might see him, you might see him sometimes on Food Fraud Channel 4 program. Chris actually wrote the white paper behind the horse meat scandal in, um, was that 2015 or 14, maybe earlier. So <clears throat> he had a huge knowledge in terms of the global fraud in food supply chain and still does. He's a fascinating guy. He, he's, um, he runs a, a conference called Food Integrity. Chris was working with these guys in terms of the meat traceability. So they were, they were taking the digital DNA of, of meat and they were putting this onto the audit trail. And I suppose that's what I was reading and that gave us the vision of could they do this with the DNA of beer. What protocol are you building on? Protocol, it was actually built on ArcNet's own protocol. So they, and that's the whole, I suppose that's the whole, not so much argument, but you know, people talk about if someone has their own protocol and platform, they then have access or they can control that. Um, so it almost takes away from that decentralized economy that, that is the big advantage of that blockchain can bring as well. So for us, we were actually working with ArcNet in the trust that their secure protocol was secure in the whole audit trail that, that we were integrating. And so, yeah, it was theirs. And it's the same with the GPASS. Um, that's built out by um, a private company as well. So the same way, I suppose, that Microsoft do it, that Oracle are doing it, or I know that there is some decentralized examples, but for us, that's, that's what we were using for the the process supply chain audit trail. Have you seen many use cases or deployments with RFID <laughs> to blockchain? Um, RFID is an interesting one. That was one that we looked at. It is, <clears throat> it's, um, cost-wise, it doesn't really work in, in beer. That was something that we're very sensitive about because we don't want to be pricing our beer a lot higher than, than a normal craft beer just because it's got this verification element. Um, people buy for the quality and, and they won't necessarily care. I have seen that used in whiskey. I believe it's, if you, if you check out Adelphi, Adelphi are a bottler that have done fusion whiskey. Uh, they use it when, as soon as you take the top off. So you can use the, that radio frequency to come back and al almost tell you then once the bottle's opened. So I have seen it used um, quite successfully in the whiskey space. Do you position the ability to track ingredients as a health or a safety feature? And with bad batches of yeast, you could trace every beer made with it across the country. I think the last one is a statement. <clears throat> yeah, that, that's something I didn't really uh, touch on. But, you know, another big factor for big bars like Flavorly. And if, if we sent them in a bad batch of beer, you know, you run beer by the size of the kit. So whether it's 3,000 litres or 6,000 litres, a lot of times, especially in craft room when you're putting new recipes to the market, a lot of times you can have a... a a bad section of beer or even the packaging. And, and if you can pinpoint that, you can actually pinpoint the recall. So rather than ripping the whole lot out of your shelves or you know out of the warehouse, that level actually does add a layer of, I, I believe it takes, is it six to seven days uh, to do a recall or pinpoint the recall? But with this, you, you can pretty much do it in real time. So that's a massive advantage, not just in health and safety, but even in cost saving. Is there an associated token, i.e. a re rewards point or incentive? Um, actually, I believe it was uh, you and I spoke about this, Erica, about yep. having a, a beer token. And it was something that we looked into. That digitization has been done. And if someone was actually, uh, Erica, you were mentioning them to me as well, that it was done around the same time we were bringing downstream to market, but they were trying to do it for festivals. And it's, it's quite difficult, to, and I suppose if you look at, at someone like an online beer site, site, it's a lot easier to integrate, and it is being done by, I suppose, websites at the minute, especially beer tokens, where if you buy £30 of beer, we we'll reward you with three beer tokens. Of course, we could integrate the same with our brands and, and say, if you continue to buy, you know, we'll, we'll give you promotions. But um, I think for us, we didn't want to push too much on the marketing element. I know there is huge capabilities here for us we're a very small team so we're ready our bandwidth was stretched immensely especially as we were 
exporting and, and setting up a distillery at the same time. So, you know, we, we, we didn't dial into that too much, but we, we definitely know that, that that is a capability to, to add that level of, of beer tokens. Or as um, what you might be touching on is actually creating your own coin and then digitizing that. But again, it just takes a whole level of uh, complexity and, and focus away from, from what we wanted to bring to the industry. Well, thank you. How do you maintain flexibility in your supply chain? Flexibility, I suppose not just in supply chain. Flexibility in the brew process is quite important because a lot of brewers are quite secret on the recipes, as you can imagine. If you can see the full brew process, you know, what stops someone from copycatting that? Or, so there is a kind of delicacy and a balance that needs to be achieved there where you for us you can you can you can put hashes in for secret ingredients you know you don't necessarily have to put every level of hop fill that you put in there yes you can time step and you can put it on the chain but again i suppose if you go then along the supply chain and if something is broken so what you i suppose you might be getting at is if something is done incorrectly which it is done a lot of times in human error you can't change the chain. It just adds, you just add another block to the chain. So that's, I suppose, the level of flexibility there, but it's also the level of security. So it's, it's kind of a, a two-way process, if that makes sense. Yeah. And someone's interested in understanding how the tracking of hops and other ingredients works, that the majority of the hops that we see in the craft beer right now are coming from the USA and New Zealand. How do you go about creating the supply chain for sustainable mm-hmm. ingredients? Yeah, that's it. So I suppose you've got to start digging pretty deep in the process and it's, it's, it's pretty mind blowing where some of this stuff comes from. For us, we, we were concentrating on a, on a unique recipe and we, we used a um, Cairo Simcoe hop, which is actually a powdered hop that comes from California. So in using that, we actually had to follow their supply chain to the people that created it and sold it. A lot of the, the kind of interest in hops and I know in, that are in a lot of beers at the moment could do come from New Zealand, uh, from the USA and, and of course from, from the UK as well. But you, 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 you have to, to get to the level of detail, you have to dig into all the suppliers and it's, it's fascinating, you know, the amount of suppliers that come into the space in one beer. But the way we did it in this instance was following that supply chain back to the person selling the hops from California and um, from the farm that, that, that create the hop in the first place. So again, as, as I mentioned earlier, you can go to the next level of detail. You know, if, if I say, where did the malts come from? Okay, I came from a farmer in the, or in the south of England. And then so, so much malt is actually blended together. So it does get, um, it does get quite difficult to get down to, I suppose, the patch of land and so hey, that, that, um, your grain came from but that's the level of detail that some people are going to now and there's a really interesting uh, distillery in ireland doing it's called waterford distillery who are actually sourcing every single field and soil element because they're i suppose wanting to prove the provenance even more in the terrar of of the field uh, of the grain that, that it's coming from so it's really up to yourself what level of detail you want to go to but yeah that's that's how we done it in this instance that we're talking about there, but really this, this thinking could be used for the entire food supply chain. Have you reached out to other producers within Ireland? Seems like a made or proved certified in Ireland branding could be very attractive in a global market. Yeah, um, we actually, we spoke at uh, the, uh, global, the global beer um, conference in Dublin last year, which, you know, had everyone from the Heineken to Diageo and all the big players and, and the Irish players there. And that was something that was mentioned uh, as I sh- kind of shown, uh, had on the screen earlier, the, the coming together, you know, the independent label is what a lot of these guys use. It was something that we spoke to our suppliers and we sent a group email out to. It's a lot more difficult uh, because some, some guys don't use uh, that label. And I think for us, uh, there's a management process there where you're bringing together, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of personalities, and then you're asking them to, again, it probably needs to be regulation that leads that rather than one business. And um, so that's kind of where we, where we left it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, next question that what about the reverse uh, from the same person Laurel Rumor what data are you learning about the consumers of your beer is there a more effective way to retain customers and create a two-way relationship in a very competitive market um, versus the beer rating sites you know to be honest we we primarily are an export company and this was almost out of you know our, our passion to show what could be done we had a lot of data there that we didn't and are not utilizing or using so we didn't retarget any of our consumers i was aware <clears throat> that you could and you know the data that you can gather is anything from a website so google analytics you can get the geolocation <clears throat> interestingly we did look at it noticing that people were scanning our beers outside of the UK or some beers are en ending up in different locations. Uh, that in turn can actually help with the fraud element. So if someone, you know, copycats that QR code and then you see thousands of scans on it, then you know that someone's uh, copycatted the, the actual concept in beer. So for us, we, we weren't reverse engineering any type of ingenious marketing plan with the data that we were gathering, but at its basics it's google analytics and it can be quite powerful because people use it every day to make a lot of money but for us we we didn't or weren't um, in that mindset well, no thank you next question does arcnet help you bring data analytics <coughs> to life between your customer and your retailer customer and retailer they, they do, like ArcNet, and even as I've seen in demos with the GPASS system, these platforms uh, do actually create really interactive reports. And so, yeah, I would say definitely they do. And they can almost simplify the headline data, <clears throat> and like any marketing report, you know, what people are, are concerned about or really interested in. So all of these guys can and have uh, currently do uh, make these reports and if retailers are interested, so, you know, it was something that I mentioned to, to m and and to, to other e-commerce guys, but a lot of these guys have their own analytics as well. So, you know, you can think of some the size of some of these guys and they've got all their, their tell data, they've got all of their, their logins and, and then, you know, so you're trying to throw more data on top of them. Um, but it is something that you can certainly give to, to retailers um, about consumers. How has Big Beer received this technology? Are the big beer companies, AB and Bev, would likely be interested for internal processes, but not to make public? Um, have you got any feedback about that? Yeah, as I yeah, as I mentioned, we did speak at the the global beer conferences, and they're you know they're always interested in in new innovations. You know, we we haven't didn't or haven't heard anything specific from them, but I do know that Big Beer uses some of this technology on Big beverage you know you've got so much fraud going on you've got ebby Bev, the biggest beverage company in the world with thousands of containers across the world so a lot of these people will try and build a level of um traceability track and trace which is out there and um, it may not have the the you know the secure blockchain element maybe it does and i'm not aware of it but these guys i'm sure would be massively interested and some of some of obviously elsa bed are is owned by William Grant and Sons, uh, one of the biggest spur companies in the world. So these guys um, are continually looking into how they can actually utilize this, this data. And not just, I suppose, fraud. Also, you've got your environmental impact as well. So, you know, where does your packaging end up? I, I think that's going to become more relevant um, over the next number of years. How does this technology compare to something like provenance, where, which uses blockchain to also track manufacturing supply chains and ingredients? Which you know, a lot of food brands use it and they're trialing it. This is Sarah Jordan is trialing it for their sustainable underwear too. That's very cool. Yeah, I, th I, th I think I've seen provenance or maybe again, it's, it's something that you made me aware of, uh, Erica, but there, there are a number, I suppose, of companies coming to market um, trying to get uptake so you know even for us we, we were moving to uh, looking to move to g pass but i'm seeing more and more um you know what becomes the global standard here is the question i think you know who and unless governments regulate it um do, does everyone then use provenance um I, I think they all bring much of the same benefits so there there isn't much difference i, I would argue between these systems it's more 
who who and usually you'll get the best uptake with the best tech solution so the most seamless the most the best user interface etc so yeah that's that's kind of where my stance is on, on the different platforms and there is no kind of i suppose it, <clears throat> there is no email or, or kind of when internet first came about that that has had a mass uptake yet but i do think it will come in time and maybe regulation will push that Really interesting, Shane, and you showed how each beer had a personalised audit trail. What about personalising the liquid itself? Is that possible? IBM are trialling something like that. It's a way to basically scan through whiskey to prove that the whiskey that's in the bottle is actually the whiskey that the outside of the bottle says it is. Is there anything like that for beer? That is fascinating because I have seen it, you know, where I've seen it in food integrity where I think they were doing it in salmon skin, and I, th- I think I know what you're what you're speaking about here. Where the the, the almost the DNA of the liquid is yeah. is is, yeah. da- is dialing the whole way back to. It. That's fascinating that IBM um, are looking at that, and I know it is achievable. It does it cre- again. It creates um, a new level of of of, of uh, synergy there, and I haven't seen it done in beer, but I'd love to see it done in beer. You know, but does I'm trying to think how do you scan how do you scan a question back is how do you scan through the liquid or can does it need to be how can a buyer get more actively involved than passive information browsing are you actively can you actively engage beyond qr scanning yep um i think what if you go to these next level of engagement you can you can set up real-time chat you could have once you get that engagement on your QR codes, you can you can move on to real time engagement with your consumer, or you can move on to obviously early adopters that then sign up to newsletters, or again you can take the the, uh, the upstream of data and retarget your demographic. So I suppose there are the three areas that I would see the re engagement happening. Why do you think tech costs are a barrier? And you mentioned that for RFID. RFID, um, beer especially is, is cost sensitive and more and more, you know, beers are getting cheaper, especially in the current environment. People are not going to pay eight or nine pounds for a lot, maybe, maybe in Norway, but they do. But the, the current UK consumer averages out at about three pounds. You can use it, you know, I'm not saying it's, it's not usable, but for us, we wanted to use the, the most what we thought was the most commercially viable and, and the difference it's not colossal you know you're probably talking everything from QR integration a couple of pence to maybe 15 20 25p for the RFID tag so it's just as a brand what which level of protection do you want to put in your product and um, they're all all these interfaces or <clears throat> integrations are available from from labelers and package package suppliers so for us we wanted to bring quality beer at a price point that we thought was fair for the consumer without having to overprice it. Okay, no, perfect, thank you. Next question from Yanis again. Why have you gone for a private blockchain network uh, versus an open source blockchain? Yeah, I, I wasn't familiar and I'm still not familiar, I suppose, with a service provider that has a public uh, blockchain that does it for products. Maybe you guys can... Um, uh, update me on that, but uh, for for what I could see in the industry a few years ago, there was only a certain amount of people providing this level of security mm-hmm. and in audit trails. Um, but I'm sure there are ones out there. Um, is there is there examples? I'd be interested to know. There there are. We can I'm sure some people, including Yanis, can probably send you some examples. Yeah, um, was it so? Was it just a question of ease and what you knew and what you could find? What we knew for me, as I, I was saying earlier, I, I see the the whole. Uh, advantages of blockchain being the decentralized part of it whether it's in currencies or whether it's in you know governments and, and how things are done that that would certainly be something that i would like to see products and, and this type of technology being mm-hmm. used for because as i say if you do it with a private company then you have the, the kind of gray area of, of um, what control they have over your uh, data okay no thank you one question from kevin gillespie he says, forgive him if you've covered this already, but how much higher net revenue contribution comes from controlling imitation and lowering costs to policing imitation, i.e. controlling fakes, basically? Yeah, I must um, 
you know, there was this, this was fascinating. It's a, it was when I, when I caught up with the, the guys doing the G pass, they, I don't have the name on, uh, of it right now, but they actually have what I spoke about earlier. They have uh, technology and um, it's fascinating. It actually could completely disrupt the uh, trademark law space. <clears throat> so for, for instance, you know, we have the trademark of downstream. No one is act- actively out there every day looking for it, but they're, they have um, technology on the platform that actually can run a scan across globally uh, search engines and pick up people that might be fraudulent using your uh, trademark or, or your product trademark. Um, so I suppose that was something that, that is fascinating um, in terms of uh, <laughs> the trademark side of things. Can sustainable sourcing certification bodies uh, onboard your network, i.e. rubber stamp the data yeah. to prove what you're doing? Yeah, I'd love to see that integration. And I think I would love to see it more and more whether people, you know, you see a lot of people wanting to get to the level of a B Corp and you see global leaders like Patagonia and, and other really interesting <clears throat> uh, people and in industries pushing the boundaries here. So <clears throat> I would love to see regulation stepping in here. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I think it will have to, especially when it comes to, to carbon footprint. So it should be an easy integration because most of, uh, both of these solutions have APIs uh, that you can build in and you can let the systems talk to one another. I think most technology systems at this stage have that. So yeah, that's, that's certainly something that, that we'd love to see happening. Have you started to tie this into your finance system, such as tracking returns and credit notes, for example? Are you putting those onto blockchain also? Yeah, we don't. We actually have a separate system that we've always used. Um, it's a B2B system, which runs like anything. So you're, it integrates with zero. You can easy, easily get this to, to talk to, I suppose you can build that out, but we, we currently don't where, you know, every can you sell, then you can actually see. And again, a lot of these e-commerce platforms that we are plugging our product into, I think a lot of them are doing, doing that type of integration where you can almost see like a real time market in front of them when people are clicking and buying and that'll, that'll show you you know your net profit your real-time uh, gross profit or you know your, your kind of nav as they call it and um, if you wanted to do a holistic view of your business mm-hmm. is it unique qr codes per beer or um is it batch production qr codes so we were initially doing it per beer and when we scaled up we were doing it per batch run but when we go back to the, the next run, the reason was because we had to turn it around in quite a short time frame. So we were doing batch codes on each beer run because that would be all the same process in liquid. But in the next release, we will be doing individuals again, uh, either either is possible, but the initial rollout was individual bottles. And then when we scaled up for M&S, we done batch runs because we had to run multiple brews and batch runs, which um, made it a little bit easier to to roll it out and get it to market for for the time frame needed now you seem to have invested heavily in promoting the blockchain but are you stepping away due to cost we were stepping away due to cost but uh, is that from promoting the blockchain you mean or yeah we for us we weren't necessarily promoting the blockchain i think that's that's more done with the platform owners mm-hmm. we really just want the solution to prove product provenance so yeah cost did deter us continuing with with Arcanet solution and we hope that we're able to showcase a more viable solution as technology has advanced you know this Mm -hmm. this kind of new solution has has only uh, come to market I think for for small businesses the last six months or so so for us we'd love to see more and more people using it but I I Mm -hmm. do think as time goes on there will be um, massive developments in this space as I'm sure you guys are seeing all the time. Just out of interest a question for me if if there were a sort of a plug-and-play blockchain platform that you could tap into and sort of dig customize maybe not 100 percent, but yeah. to a degree but that were more accessible and easy to set up and more affordable is that something that you think you and course, other small producers yeah. would be looking at i think more so for independent producers because this is their usp you know they want to showcase their independence their recipes that they're not a mass produced um product so <clears throat> and then I, I think it would probably get to the stage where people want to buy um, people using that plugin, you know, they'll not buy it unless it is kind of fur create on steroids. It has that real level of, of uh, transparency. Thank you, Shane. So this Tech for Sustainability series is sponsored by Trace. So they're a connected value 
blockchain platform. They foster a culture of innovation and uh, encourage sustainable business practices and ensure consumer trust in the diamond industry. They work with De Beers and some of the largest diamond producers in the world and demonstrate provenance, traceability and authenticity of natural diamonds and help local economies um, where their minds. So anyone can find out more just by going to community.tracer, that's T-R-A-C-R dot com. Um, so very grateful to Tracer, the, the diamond uh, blockchain for supporting this series.